Welcome to the Blacksmith Chronicles podcast, the official podcast of Ryan Johnson Ministries. This podcast was created for the purpose of equipping others for the advancement of the kingdom of God. We hope that you enjoy this episode and encourage you to subscribe to the Blacksmith Chronicles today. For more information about Ryan Johnson Ministries, please visit www.ryanjohnson.us or email us directly at info at ryanjohnson.us. Hey guys, welcome to the Blacksmith Chronicles podcast. I am super excited this week to welcome a new guest. I have never even met this individual in person, got connected uh, actually through the ministry of his wife and, and other connections as well. And I'm really fascinated because you don't hear a lot on these terms, the heart of the ministry of our guests. It's something that is much needed and we must address within the body of Christ and really as individuals in the kingdom. Uh, and so beyond all that, there's a multifaceted things that's going to be offered on this, but I'm just super, super stoked. Very honored to welcome this week's guest, Stephen De Silva. Thank you so, so much for being a part of this uh, episode of the Blacksmith Chronicles podcast. Thank you so much, Ryan. I appreciate that invitation and introduction, man. That makes me feel really good. Thank you. No, I'm <laughs> we, super happy to be here and talk about this stuff. It's fun. Well, we will get a cup of coffee one day in person, or at least a good <laughs> meal, something like that. So when the two worlds collide, uh, it will happen indeed. But for those that may not be familiar with you and the ministry that you have, our life in general, family life, whatever you want to share, give us a little bit of a background of who Stephen is. Thank you. I am. Um, I was a CPA. I started up as a farm boy and learned how to mechanic. From there, I decided this too hard, man, that's too hard of a lifestyle for me. So um, I, I shifted as a young man into college and learned some skills in the, in the accounting field. I became certified as a CPA, ran a business for a number of years, my own practice, and during that time, I also became a senior leader at a church and was their CFO or financial officer. So I had this kind of mixture world between technical financial guy and pastoral, uh, you know, ministry guy. And so during, uh, you know, I probably spanning about 40 years right there. And it was around my 40th birthday, I think I figured out the secret to money, and that is that it is both skill and belief, but most financial lessons and our information in the world talks about the skills, which is important, but skills will always bow to what you believe. So we got to get down and figure out what we're believing and uh, fix that. Otherwise, we're never going to really you know, fix things. We're never going to get over stuff. So anyway, that's me in a nutshell, and so now I just run a ministry and run around, wave my arms as much as I can and talk as loud as and as much as I can and help people just get over their financial stuff so we can get to mastery over this money thing. It really is a uh, vital part of our life. You know, I just even this morning in teaching a class, we love to talk about the gospel being free and the gospel message is free, but the means necessary to make the gospel available aren't free ministry mm -hmm. costs money uh you know living expenses alone uh, anybody that is raising a family or married or even single you understand that money is a very key issue but yeah. i'm really intrigued right off the bat here you said that the practical things the, the um, i can't remember exactly the words you used but it will be that we will bow down to those things because of what we believe what is it about that or expound on that. Why is our belief system so important compared to the practical side of fi um, our finances? Yeah, thanks. I think that I I think that we're we're built. I believe in a God, and I believe He made us in that uh, kind of mindset or worldview orients the fact that I've been designed. I'm not just some accidental blob of cells that happen to function. I'm this designed thing. That means there's a designer. And I think the designer built us to follow something greater than ourselves, right? And I think that 
that something greater than ourselves, if we could put quotes around that, uh, you know, the, the, everyone on the planet has faith, whether even atheists have faith that there's nothing to have faith in, I suppose we could say it that way. So um, I think that we are all engineered to pursue something greater than ourselves. In the world of money, we, well, really in the world of humanity, we kind of stick all sorts of things into that bucket that is something greater. And of course, as, as a Christian, I put this person, Jesus Christ, in there, but a lot of people put many things in there. And I end up working with many, many people of all kinds of stripes and spots. And I really love that. But what's interesting is what they've put in that bucket of something greater. Hmm. And whatever that is, I mean, you can put money in there. You can put sex in there. You can put, um, you can put alcohol or chemistries in there. You can do all sorts of things in there. You can put yourself in there. You can, uh, you know, your image. You, you know, it's just, just, you can put food in there. It's crazy. Uh, I don't mean literally crazy. It's it's fascinating what people will place into the something greater bucket. And once you do that, that is going to lead lead you. And if you have a leader, the bucket, then you become a follower. So we're all following something. Uh, we're designed. That's a pull system. If you can see, if you can imagine that, that bucket is pulling me along, and behind me are all my decisions. Uh, yeah, that that. That's what we recognize in the financial arena. People have put into the bucket uh, belief systems, things they've learned, you know, like money is evil or I will be destroyed by money. And yet I need it. So I have this almost schizophrenic battle over money. You mentioned ministries and churches and businesses, and we kind of need money to keep those things functioning. It's the same thing. You know, a lot of those companies or a lot of us as business entrepreneurs and builders we want to do good we want to be good people and yet we think money kind of makes me bad because it stains my fingers so what we we've got this battle going on well we can solve that that battle and resolve it and uh, i got a lot of things i can talk about on that but that is the crux of what you ask this competition inside of us needs to be settled around the subject of money. Otherwise, we just live this, frankly, tortured, uh, unsure lifetime around money. We need it, and then we get it, and it either makes us misbehave, or we maybe do something good, or we waste a bunch of it, or we go into cycles and patterns, and pretty soon we're scratching our head and very confused. And that's the way most people I find experience the kind of the space of money they're just confused sometimes angry about it they're afraid of it uh, those reactions are normal when you're out of control and dealing with a animal you can't tame why do you think that when we discuss money we become very in church culture we become very hesitant versus in maybe spending money on frivolous things that brings us temporary joy. Why do you mm. think there is that restriction uh, or that contention between money when we bring it into a church culture versus when we use money for ourselves? Oh boy. Well, there's probably lots of answers to that, but I think a lot of it is uh, we're just suspicious of motivations you know, money's hard to get. Once you get it, you usually for most people is you're selling time in exchange for money. So when somebody takes your money, they have just stolen part of your life. And that burns, you know, when somebody steals steals from you. If they still steal a coffee cup, no problem. But if they steal a chunk of my life that I've invested, um, the time it took me to make that money, that that really burns. And so we're we're suspicious and protecting. We've built up defenses, I think, out of necessity. There's a lot of bad guys and a lot of good guys that we think are good and their motives are kind of screwy. So, you know, I think that's why when we get into the Christian space, we want to believe we're surrounded by safety, people with the same value. But money exaggerates what what's inside the heart of people. I, I I think that money is a spiritual power, and power of that kind always exaggerates whatever's in your heart. 
anyone. It, it's like God designed it this way. And I can tell you why I think that is, but let me just finish this thought. Money is a spiritual power. Power exaggerates whatever a person believes. And when you get into the Christian space, we are uh, nervous that that money is going to exaggerate something in our ourselves, our people around us, that is just, uh, you know, harmful, hurtful, thievery, you know, abuse, abusive. So I think that now I think when I get it in, into the world, I think that same defense happens out there. But I think out there, uh, when I work in the marketplace, let's say among business people, I don't really expect them to have a higher standard. I just expect them to be kind of, you know, getting by. I mean, I don't have a higher um, a higher requirement in my framework for them. It's just they're out there to make money and I'm in the food chain right now. So I'm going to be careful out here and I'm going to behave properly and accordingly. When I get into the church, can I let my things, my defense down or not? I don't know. So uh, I don't think that that's a healthy thing. I don't think that's a, a sign of a healthy church, but I do think it is a reality that we are all experiencing in Christ Christianity. And I want to spread that across the globe because I've been to a bunch of countries, uh, been teaching this for a long time. And uh, although cultures are different, they all demonstrate very common fears and responses to this thing that money exaggerates so what would be i guess i would i would have to define it as unknown maybe an unknown recognition um when we talk about the fear that is attached to money what is something that maybe again un unknown may not be the right word Mm -hmm. but something that we just do not anticipate or expect to really discover when it comes to, we have this fear concerning money, because I think like you're saying, a lot of times my mind goes, you know, I expect every once in a while for the fast food restaurant to mess my order up. I don't <laughs> expect the pastor or the leaders of the house to keep messing up. You know, I don't expect yeah. that because of that level of standard. So exactly. I get that to a degree, but uh, when, when we're talking about finances in a fear, whether it's, you know, a holy fear or a, a, mm -hmm. a, a, a wrong fear in that sense, what's something that really catches people off guard that they don't typically mm -hmm. anticipate? In the subject of money. Yes, sir. They discover that surprises them. Okay. Well, I think there is a one answer on that. I think that when people dig deep enough, they discover their problem is with money is a is sourced in an identity crisis. Well, and I think that, yeah, I think that the the person. Uh, I, let me give you an example. That years ago, I was sitting in a, a restaurant, a little greasy spoon. It was one of the best in town, but it's a little tiny thing. And we, I take my sons in there and I go, I'm going to show you what the country breakfast is. So we go in there, it's just me and my two boys. And they were probably in their, you know, eight to 10 air, 10 age, somewhere in there, maybe younger. And we're in there and we sit down at this little table with a checkered tablecloth and behind the salt and pepper, there's a, I think it was a $20 bill. And, uh, as we sit down, my sons see this bill and they are like, wow, we found buried treasure, right? They found buried treasure. And I was telling them, oh, that doesn't belong to us. I mean, if just like anyone would, you know, oh, that, that belongs to the waitress because she's been working hard and doing this table and that's called a tip and somebody's left it. So we're just going to leave it there. And then our attention gets distracted and someone comes, some uh, customer comes by and takes it, takes it very sneakily puts it in his pocket or he tries to and, and goes out and my kids see it <clears throat> and they're like dad dad that guy just took the tip and i was like what what happened and he said he took the tip he's outside that guy outside and i go what uh, well that's not happening okay well i'm not a big guy and this guy was <laughs> i don't know what seized me but this temporary insanity i get out of my seat 
I go out through the door and I challenge this guy in the parking lot, dude, that doesn't belong to you. Put it back. And the guy's like, what, little man? <laughs> I'm like, that is not yours. You put it back. And uh, he he said some choice words, crumpled the dollar, the 20 bucks up and threw it on the ground and drove off. And then sobriety, re you know, returned. And I'm thinking, oh, my gosh, what am I doing? Anyway, I bring it back. I set it down. I tell the kids. They're thinking, wow, dad, you're so brave. I'm thinking, dad, you're so dumb. <laughs> but what is going on here is a demonstration of three identities that a person can seize on and they and this is what lives down in our hearts and these three identities are in every single story great piece of literature in human in human history as far as i can tell it's the victim the villain and the hero and we all play it we all we might move around but we all find a role in life and it's connected to our identity. We are either a victim where life happens to us, or we're a villain where we happen to life. We, we make life serve us, or we become a hero who interrupts that cycle, defends and rescues the victim, and corrects and boundaries the villain. And so when it comes to money, when that I said that money is a spiritual power and it exaggerates us, exaggerates what's ever in our heart. What I mean in part by that is money will make that role get bigger. And when you see someone, when you see a $20 bill, now for most of us, $20 isn't a big test. But if it was a you know, you know, ten thousand dollars laying somewhere, that has the potential to exaggerate what we're really doing. Do we look around? and think maybe I could take that. That's the victim exaggerated. I don't wanna get caught or punished. Let's see if I can take that. The villain is like, I deserve that and I'm going to take that and I'm gonna make sure nobody else finds it. I'm gonna hide it and disguise it and then I'm gonna get it. The hero is like, if that gets exaggerated, it's like, oh my gosh, I wonder who, that, who owns that. Let me, let me get it, protect it and make sure it gets in their hands. And this is what goes on. That is at the root of financial problems, the identity we have. That's why I say it's an identity crisis. That really is a fascinating answer to me. I, I just, I've never thought of that. I, I, I go back now to the biblical side of that. I think of the parable of the sower uh, and what they do with the seed, yeah. you know, and, and how we, you know, there's three examples there on that side of it. So it's just like, it makes my mind kind of grow uh, with uh, a lot of process in that because that really is something that's very, very profound in that aspect. So when if we move beyond the individual and we look at church, we look at the local church, why and, and I know this is this is one of these things that can have multiple layers of answers here, but yeah. What is it that really can uh, causes a lot of these local churches to never move beyond where they just kind of top out at? They just, it, it's like mm. they, you know, they get 50 people and they have X amount of dollars in the bank account and they just never grow beyond that. And it, it's this complacency comes in and, you know, we don't want to, oh. we're doing good financially. So we don't want to talk about finances. We're, you know, or we're, we're struggling. Yeah. We're not going to talk about finances. You know, I, I wow. always, I'm always fascinated by the local church and the hangups in that. And I'm looking, you know, just for some common mistakes that these make, because at the end yeah. of the day, even if you're running 50 people, if you have wealth in the treasury, you can do a lot for your community, even with 50 people, whether it's clothing oh, the homeless or, you know, soup kitchens, whatever the case may be, yeah. again, finance wow. is important. So why, what is, <laughs> what are some of the things that just causes local churches to level out? Yeah. Oh man, you are just uh, trying to get me in a fight here, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> trying to hear some rope, Steve, see if you can get that around your neck a little bit. <laughs> well, I mean, we, we, we just got to talk these things out. Yeah, because, man. I mean, I just, yeah. my heart breaks, genuinely, my heart breaks to see a plateau reach that really is nothing more than a foothill. Yeah, yeah, golly. 
Well, you're you're hitting it on the head, Ryan. I you are right. I agree. There's lots of layers to this, and I if I what I'm about to say is unfair to say it's across everyone, right? right. It's everybody's situation. But um, I I want to be respectful and careful for church leaders because I've been one, and it's super tough. But I recognize how different we are as a body of Christ today compared to that early church. When we read about, you know, Jesus has resurrected, he's appeared, he's given some commissions and instruction, and then this little baby church begins to happen. And Acts is a fascinating read. Read Luke and Acts together. They're written by the same person. Yeah. Package those two like this is one big story from this professional guy, Luke, talking to a, a certain person about the things he's seen and what has happened. And he's covering two periods of time. And I just recognize those, that first century church was, it was, it was frightening to be excluded. So to be included was what you needed because inside was care, protection, healing, power. It was just a, an amazing environment. And that's why it would say people were, it says it in the book of Acts, people were afraid to harass this, the way, the community, right? Well, I don't think we have anything close to that now. When I see churches now, people come and go and it's like, ah, eh, you know, I don't, I didn't really like the, you know, the, the tie the guy wore. So I'm going to go try another church getting in or out, especially because of this COVID thing and how it's isolated us and we, we've gotten comfortable sitting in our houses watching church through a Zoom or a video. Um, I just don't think there's the reverence there was. And I think the reverence, the reason for that reverence missing is our church's fault. I think my fault, because I think churches, to answer your question directly, I think generally many churches have grown comfortable in building their program, emphasis on their program, rather than the things that you opened and said, you know, feeding the poor and the hungry, you know, putting clothes on the, on the people that need clothes, um, just taking care, building soup kitchens, taking care of the community, demonstrating power in our community in real ways where people can come out from underneath their bushes and trees. And we have a lot of homeless folks in our area. And um, when those people come out, they, they have needs. Some of them are emotional, some are mental, some are physical. The body of Christ should be doing that, not the government. That's our job. And the fact that we've kind of stepped away from that is so accusatory. And I, I rarely bring this up, but this is your deal, right? You like to get in and bang around on some of these things. So this is this is just my thought. I just think the body of Christ has left the arena that we were engineered to reach. And because of that, government has stepped in with programs that we all get mad at and point at and accuse. But the truth is, we're not doing it. So someone does. Consequently, the esteem, the reverence, the awe that we held in those days has waned. And that's that's what I think we have now. Now, I don't think it's permanent. I think, I think we can and must fix it. In fact, I think that's kind of what God's working on right now. I think the body of Christ has been really shaken. People of faith generally in many, many ways and many other varieties, but we've just been shaken. Our, our truth system, our belief systems are being rattled not kind of rattled around like a marble in a box and we got to decide, okay, what, wait, is God good or not? You know, how does this work? And um, I think there's what I read in the early church, like the gospels, acts, the epistles. I read a little teeny church, a baby church, trying to figure out how it works and these great teachers correcting it and laying down instruction. This is how it works. This is what you should do. This is what you shouldn't do. This is life in this baby church. I think we can, we can eat that. We can literally consume that, apply it to our lives and watch those, I think churches wake up, become amazing.
you know, because we do have the answers. We just need to get back in the right, in the right uh, boxing ring and start swinging. Well, that's the thing. It, it, it's never going to be across the board the same answer because there's a lot of churches out there that's doing a phenomenal job in what they're doing. But there is, just because there's a lot of churches doing a phenomenal job, doesn't mean that we can turn a blind eye to those that aren't being to their full potential of what they should be in the kingdom. And I I think back, how many churches have opened up their facility for elections? And I'm all for that. I'm not against that whatsoever. But at the same time, if we can turn our fellowship hall into an election center, why can't we turn it in at least once a month into a feeding center? Wow. You know, I, I'm just that's that's really good. You know, th- yeah. these these little things to get back because I have a genuine concern. I'm a um, I'm relatively a young man. I've been married for 24 years. I have four children. Two of them are older. Two of them are younger. And like everyone else that has a family and, you know, potentially one day going to have grandchildren or do you look at the status of where we're at right now? There's a growing um a growing and ever growing need for individuals to have their needs met by the government. And, you know, it's, when am I going to get my stimulus check or when are they going to do that? And why is it only this? And I need to do this and so on and so forth. Now I'm not sitting here saying that every church ought to create stimulus checks for individuals. That's not what I'm saying whatsoever, but as churches, I do believe there's a a massive struggle because we have forsaken the responsibility of the community and permitted a federal government or local government to step in to be what we were actually called to be. And this is the reason I'm fascinated by this because again, the hindrance in all this is connected to finances. If there's no finances, Mm. we say, I can't feed the community. I can't clothe the community. I can't do these things you know, because there's no finances. Well, if there's no finances, then we have to stop and say, okay, how can we accumulate finances to do these things? So this is where I'm going with here. What are some practical things that churches can do to start uh, really building up a treasury for their community? Wow. Wow. What a great question. Well, I, as you're talking, I'm thinking of a quote I remember. I'll, I'll probably not say it accurately, but it comes from a book by um, Stearns is the author's name. I forget this first name. And uh, he wrote the, the, the title is a, The Hole in Our Gospel. And he, he makes a statement in there. He calculates that the economic power of people of faith is big enough in one single year from just offerings that are turned in, the income that they're all generating. Imagine all the people of faith, and he's just talking the United States, their income taken uh, and what they are then in turn giving out as seed, that alone is bigger than most. I think it was the federal government's budget, the US federal government's budget for both defense and foreign aid, which is a massive number. His point was, the, there is an economy hiding inside of an economy that is the people of faith and how we value bread and seed and how we understand that we need to sow. And that amount sown is so big that you could pay off in one year. You could completely solve worldwide the problem of unclean water plus malaria on every continent. Plus, uh, he had one other category in there. In other words, the, it's, it's, in, it's staggering the amount of money that is moving through the hands of believers just in the United States. Now, here's my point and his as well, which I, I want to cautiously recommend that book. There's some things in it that I'm not uh, you know, fully on board, but the guy's a genius. And it is a valuable book, I think, to jar us and realize how much kingdom economics are flowing through our fingers wasted and if we Mm. would learn to steward that and simply imagine a bucket and if we could plug those holes then throwing that bucket of water on the fire and we could put out massive fires as a people of faith in other words we have the means we just don't have the will uh, which is probably the main point of his book where's the will 
to do what's needed to be done is kind of what we're talking about. Where is the body of Christ going to find the money to, you know, do these things? Oh, we've got it. The kingdom economy is alive and well. It's flowing through our hands. And I know that some of us are facing some pretty stressed times because we are in a probably once in a generation experience. It's very, very weird. Uh, the deeper we look into COVID and the response and just how things are working. But let's put, let's just accept that. Okay, that's our situation. And we have been, um, we've been, we, people of faith and others, we've been backed up or reduced in the amount of money that's flowing through our fingers. Okay, but bread and seed applies whether you have a little or a lot. And the point is, this kingdom economy should still be operating. Everyone should be uh, receiving bread, separating bread and seed from what they receive. Put it into two piles and make sure the seed gets in the ground and not in their mouth and make sure the bread gets in their mouth and not in the ground, <laughs> right? We got to keep those things straight. Otherwise we have all sorts of problems. And that is the solution. And I think, you know, to your question, yeah, uh, there, it, it takes money to do this stuff. I think I would add to that. We got to build the will and then a discipline to make it happen. That, yeah, I can definitely see that. I can, I can see that if you don't have a heart for it, you're yeah. never going to, you're going to be, you're never going to be disciplined to do it. I mean, that's just, that's yeah. just a reality to that. And I think that's goes without saying that there's probably a lot of ministry just don't have a heart for it. They're building in, whatever they're building versus a kingdom mindset. And that's just, you know, that's how it's going to be. But in saying that, let's say you have an individual, because I want to speak to the individuals in this. You have yeah. an individual that maybe their church is not doing that. Can they not apply ah. those same principles and they themselves yeah. as individuals build and, and do it? That's a great point. Yeah, absolutely. In fact, we have to, because we got to remember, we, our head as people of faith, in, as followers of Jesus, our head is not the church or that pastor or that senior team. Our head is Jesus. And <laughs> this is a very flat organization. This ecclesia that we're part of, this church structure is very flat. Although in our culture, we've made it kind of a kind of a pyramid thing we've kind of built it into layers and structures but that isn't you know that isn't actually accurate it's pretty flat one head telling all of us to do things well we don't need to blame the churches and the pastors i'm not trying to do that i'm saying hey i'm looking in the mirror saying i need to listen to jesus and his words where do you find those go read the gospels man find that red letter stuff and really dig into it and then act on it and you're going to find yourself I think convicted by the Holy Spirit and directed by the Holy Spirit into the path that we're talking about. I think we have to. If we if we're not willing to do that, I I guess if it were me and I'm I'm a farm boy, so I would say I'm going to go uh, slap myself upside the head because I'm not I'm not in the game. I'm not. What am I doing? I'm just poser. When I'm you know if I'm not actually following the words of Jesus, um, Jesus Himself said, "Those who love me will obey me." He, he wasn't saying, I'm a tough master. You got to follow me like a, like a, uh, you know, some kind of a dictator. He's saying, no, this is how it works. When you love me, you do what I say. And <laughs> we got to get going. I hold myself to the same, uh, absolutely the same reflection in the mirror. And this year, I won't say any of the details, but I recognize that, wow, a certain situation is in front of me. I'm going to have to either solve that and really get uncomfortable in my comfortable little life, or I'm going to ignore it and stay comfortable and then try not to look at the mess I've created. It deals with a certain family, there's a young family, little, little kids with uh, no home. What am I going to do about that? I mean, that is actual reality that's sitting right in front of me. And oh, I just couldn't, it came to the end is like, I can't stand in front of God and pray with an honest heart if I haven't dealt with this thing and actually put some skin in the game. So, you know, I am, I'm, I'm talking my own medicine here. It's like, ooh, wow, that's, it's disruptive. It's uncomfortable. Oh, wait a minute. I think that is throughout 
the gospels and the epistles. Um, I'm reading uh, James and Peter right now, and it's just saying, hey, man, there's some trials you got to go through. Oh, I hate that part. <laughs> but, but this is it, man. Let's roll up our sleeves and, and get in this thing. Let's get in it for real. <laughs> James, that's the book that when you get done reading, you feel a whole lot better about yourself. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He just is soft and, you know, encouraging. Yeah. And, yeah. Yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. That's a, that's a tough book to swallow because uh, whenever wow. you think you have arrived, read the book of James. You'll find out you still got a lot to learn <laughs> uh-huh. for sure. Yeah. But, I'll you show know, you your faith by your works. <laughs> oh, stop it. <laughs> You know, here's the thing. I can imagine people that are listening uh, to the podcast or watching on YouTube. They're sitting here and they're going, yeah, yeah, that's all good. Sounds great. I could have done that in 2016, 2017, 2018. But I mean, come on, Stephen. We just came out of 2020 and we're rolling into 2021 kind of the same way we've been most of the time in 2020. I mean, the pennies are few and, um, you know, we're stretching it here and there. And, um, you know, we're having to stockpile because you don't know when you're going to be able to get certain stuff. How can I be really responsible and a good steward of my finances in this global pandemic and the chaos that we're in? What are just some practical things that we can put into application in this season? Wow. What a great question. You're, You're tough. You're a tough uh, interviewer, bro. You, you go for the throat. <laughs> Next time I'll wear a turtleneck. No, um, no, no, it's, a, it's the right question. And I would have to say for, for practical reasons, I would have to say, don't stop bread and seed. In other words, make sure something is always sown and something is always consumed, right? Um, part, you know, let's use... Uh, you know, 80%, 20%. I'm just crudely saying 100% of whatever, whatever I get. And um, I could probably go toe-to-toe with anyone uh, on this last 12 months on battles for income and trying to find where the income was going to come from. I, I don't think anybody can even, <laughs> will even be close. It's been rough. And as the money comes in, I'm faced with what do I do? It does come in. Sometimes through miracles, sometimes through a job that I pick up, sometimes through something I've sold, or sometimes it's a gift. I put all those together. These are ways things are coming into your hand. Make sure you break it into two piles. Something has to go into back into the ground. Now, that, that can go to your church as an offering. It could go as an extra roll of toilet paper. To the neighbor. Okay, I don't know why there was such a panic over toilet paper for a while, but hey, man, you finally nab a bunch of toilet paper rolls or paper product rolls, break one out of it and give it away. That's that's just as generous as putting money into your offering at church. You know what I'm saying? So there's just ways to do that. You need to to listen to somebody when you're tired. That is a gift of your time. Don't ever stop sewing. And it your dollars, your, the check you write might be different now than it was two years ago. Don't worry about that. God isn't about the size. He's about the, the faithfulness. There's a verse, I think it's in Hebrews. It says, the Bible says that uh, you cannot please God. Let's see. Without faith, you cannot please God. Hebrews it's a faith. fascinating. Thank you. It's a fascinating idea. He doesn't say, you know, you've got to give money. He doesn't say uh, you've got to be a pastor. He doesn't say any of these things. He just says the ingredient that we all have to include is faith. And so I can have, I can do all things with faith. I mean, I'm not talking about the boundaries of being stupid and disobedient and all that stuff. I'm talking about I can manage my money by faith. I can give away time. I can give away a toilet paper roll. I can give away some dollars. I can give money to the guy on the street who could use a sandwich. You know what? I could too. How about I 
give something to this guy to help him out, give him a sandwich, you know, buy him a lunch, whatever. But my point is everything that comes to you, no matter how big, needs to be divided into two piles. And something belongs in your mouth, something belongs in the ground. Find ways to give and faithfully do that and just ask God to bless it. And, and don't worry about the size. You know, am I the big guy who's beating my chest and putting money in at the offering? And then the little widow comes and drops two little coins. Ding, ding. They were widow's mites. And Jesus noticed the widow because she was doing it in faith. The other guy was giving out of his excess. This doesn't matter on the money. This matters on faith. So I think everything that comes has, has to be divided. Seed and bread. Yeah, I love that because I've, I've said for a number of years, God is never after the numerical value. He's always after the obedience. So Come I, on. I really like that a lot. So here, here's, I, I have to ask this because when we're talking about finances and we're, the, the reality is finances come to us because we go to work, we serve, we do a job, you know, Yes, it comes in gift form, but if you're going to provide for your family, you got to get a job. You got to go to work. And there, yeah. should, there should be no shame because you flip burgers or you're right. in uh, some kind of service industry or whatever the case may be. You don't have to have the top floor office in all things, you know, provide for your family in whatever way you can provide. Yeah. And I wow. know that there's programs out there that help people that are in need. And I'm not discredited in those programs. I'm not discredited in ever having a need because there's, there's situations that happen in life that put people in circumstances that they were never intended to be. I mean, if you have a young mother who loses her husband suddenly to an accident, you know, now she's probably dependent on a government program to help her. And there's nothing wrong with that. But I do have to ask the question, Stephen, is it wrong for us as sons of God to go beyond the help and we become dependent upon the government to provide for us? Ooh, wow, that's a really rough one. Let me let me process that for a minute. Maybe just out loud, I'll just start talking, and then if we find out I'm I'm totally wrong, we can delete it from the video. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> if I later hate it, but yeah, you know I. When I have people coming to me and asking, what do I do? They're usually in triage. You know, I don't get people come through my door when everything's going great. They're coming in because something is broken. So when I, when I have somebody come to me that's, they're, they're in trouble financially, um, I don't do a lot of, you know, if you had enough faith or I, that's not my jam. What I'll do is, hey, let's, let's go find every possible life preserver financially we can find and absolutely include it includes um you know any governmental program we can nab let's let's go turn all this stuff on because like i said earlier i think those governmental programs are there for a reason because the church has been vacant so right. to penalize a person with that logic is silly Be, let, let's get them out there and get them the help once we get a person stable and their tummy's fed and they're warm or safe or in a place where they can think, then what we do is we, we begin to grow them into self-stability. Once we get them, that's your job. That's your, uh, let's go out and get you. Uh, we've, we've been helping you. Here's the charity. Here's the welfare. That's necessary. The next step is now let's get you off of that and onto a stable platform. After that comes, let's get you in a place of a success. And I'm going to cautiously define success in the Hebrew light rather than the Western eyes. Okay. In the, um, I like to, there's a lot of things I teach. There's a separation between our culture and the ancient culture we love to study in the Bible. That is the Hebrews and the Jewish culture and the Christian culture. But let's just pull those apart for a minute. In the, um, in the West where we are, success is, it's like a moving moving target. It's always the next job. You get a job, you get a promotion. It isn't many months and you kind of grow into that and you're like unsatisfied. And you know what I really need is the next thing. I want the next thing. And there's this unsatisfiable uh, desire for more. And that is kind of a Western model. 
Uh, the Hebrew model, I'm going way back now. This is back into the book of Genesis. We're talking Abraham. The Hebrew model is anyone who is, okay, there's a curse in Genesis that says that, um, uh, you know, out of the toil of the earth, you're going to bring forth your food. You're going to clothe yourself. You've got these basic needs. And in Genesis, it says that is going to require work. So in this Hebrew idea, if we drew that on a graph and said, I'm fed, I'm covered, and I'm, um, what, there was a third one. I have clothing, I have food, and I have covering. I have a place to live. That's a basic needs line that is in the mindset of a Hebrew ideology. Anyone above that is considered successful because they have overcome the curse. Okay, so their idea of success is way down lower compared to the West. We have this success for us in the West is, oh man, you know, when I get that, you know, place in my business or my job where I'm making $250,000 a year or a month, or, you know, we just get these, it's just as endless. In this Hebrew ideology, if I am below the line, I'm in need and people will come and help me. That's, that's the condition of welfare need. Anything above it, I am now a success and I'm not trying for more success. I'm trying to learn to manage power. So all hmm. this up here is power. All this down here is need. And the Hebrew mindset is learn how to carry, build capacity to carry however much power they gain. When I say power, I'm referring to the spiritual power that money does when it exaggerates us. So they just have a different model. And, and this, is, this is really helpful for me. I think, I think we need to understand our assignment is to carry faithfully whatever God chooses to give us. And as we do that, that tends to look like faithfulness. And then the Bible says in Hebrews, God is a rewarder of those who seek him. So we have this succession happen and that's where we have these people. We're gonna move them from welfare into stability, into faithfulness. And that would be my category of success. And that means they're gonna have to start managing power. They become self-sufficient Man, we need that. That wasn't that a natural mindset in our founding fathers and mothers. That was, that was what they were after for the sake of a future generation. Now, I think everyone's generally in the United States is we're trying to keep hold of our comforts. Oh, mm. uh, uh, man, I got to get off my soapbox. I'll get, <clears throat> I'll get to spitting and cussing here if I don't watch it. So. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> to me, that is such a profound answer uh, because I, I meet more and more people as the older I get, I, I kind of kid and say, uh, I feel like I'm turning into the old man screaming, get off my lawn, or at least um, the two old men from Secondhand Lions. I see myself turning oh, into them great more movie. and more, <laughs> you know, more like Robert yeah, Duvall probably, but yeah, nevertheless, yeah. Uh, it, it's it's one of those things. And and I, I just look at people and I'm going, hey, we're not, we're called to be co-laborers. We're not called to be dependent yep. upon mankind in any form or function. So it, it's just yeah. one of those things that I love that. And, and, and I know we need to express that, but I, I could go on and on and on because I believe this is such a valuable topic, but for the sake of time, I, I, you know, I'll lower all my questions and I'll say to you, Stephen, I want to give you the final thought. Maybe there's something that you want to share, speak into those that are listening or watching on YouTube and, there's something that is, you know, resounding in your heart concerning the kingdom, concerning, you know, kingdom economics, whatever the case may be, and really kind of share that. I want to give you the opportunity to have the final thought. Wow. Well, I think what I'm going to say is an encouragement for anyone who's listening that the 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 church for the for the believers that are listening there could be others and i welcome them 
But for the people that follow this Jesus, they need to remember this environment we're in, as hard as it feels, and it for some, it is devastating. There, it's, it is really tough. But I'm saying that the church that we are part of was born in a crazy time of history. Jews, Greeks, Romans. I mean, think of the Roman Empire is like squatting on top of their nation. Think about what that must have been like. And the, the church and this story and person of Jesus caught like, like a fire, like a wildfire, because he had the answers to the people who had need. And this is no different. So remember that. Don't be discouraged. I'm, I'm sure there are there is discouragement. I'm sure there's fatigue. I'm sure there's confusion and doubt and worry. Hey, we're natural people. That's, that's our condition. But don't stop there. If you need, block yourself a time every week to close your eyes and sit in a good chair and take a deep breath and just sit in the face of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Just wait and don't just hold your prayers for a minute every time you do this and just listen and after a little while then tell them what you need but my point is remember to hope there is no reason for us to give up and there's a lot of forces on us a lot of pressures golly i i get it not only in my own life but i have lots of people coming into me that i do this kind of connection with in sessions and i just hear them some of them are just bowed down under this stuff and it's like don't get under the stuff i'm not saying the stuff isn't real or hard but i'm encouraging you don't get under get over the circumstances sit on top of it and take some time with the father in heaven who loves us more than we can imagine he's better than you think just just take some time and be with him that will address the identity crisis where we first started talking about. The root of all financial problems, in my opinion, is an orphan gap, a space between ourselves and the Father of Lights. Collapse that. That's what I do. Get that thing, that space collapsed, because that space is what the devil exploits. So you close that space, and there's nowhere for him to come banging on anything. Just get in at God's face, and I'm telling you, in fact, I'd like to pray for your people. Is that cool? Absolutely. Father, I, I pray right now for anyone listening who's tired or afraid or you've got that emotion. I just speak peace. I just say, hush, be still. I'm, I'm repeating the words of Jesus over a crazy stormy sea that these sailors, these disciples couldn't navigate. These were, these were sailors. They knew the ocean, and yet they were threatened and afraid. Jesus wakes up, commands, hush, be still, and the waves calm and the wind stops. I speak that and repeat that to everyone listening over your circumstances, that you would have a calmness to hear from your Father in heaven. I pray your breakthrough. I pray your miracles. I pray the power of God in your life. It's as real today as it was in anything we read in the Bible. I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So, okay, one more question. Yes, sir. How can people get in contact with your ministry to learn more, to expound, to grow? What is the website information? <laughs> awesome. Well, all my stuff is living at stephenkdsilva.com. And the, that's Stephen with a PH, K like kite, and D Silva. Dot com And there's some, oh, there's a bunch of free stuff in there. So there's a store. If you look in the store, there's free stuff and then there's buy stuff. But go into the free stuff. There's some cool things in there. And uh, I think everyone will enjoy that. I got books and manuals and courses. I'm loaded with stuff. So can't awesome. help myself. And you're on all the social media? Facebook, yeah, Instagram, I've always... Yeah, yeah. I, yeah, I got a YouTube channel somewhere. I, I you know, all that stuff is... <laughs> Somewhere out there. I don't know. But uh, yeah, there's Instagram stuff. I have a weekly Facebook um, little deal on my on my ministry page, which is 
uh, Stephen K. De Silva Ministries. So yeah, there's stuff around for, for me. Just look me up. Awesome. I sincerely appreciate you taking out the time to be a part of this episode. Really meant a lot to me personally, and I believe everyone that's listening or watching are going to be able to get a lot of information that's going to be valuable for them and their community. Wow. I, you know, I, I, if I have time, edit yes. this if you need, but I love the Blacksmith Chronicles idea. You see my family, ranchers, and I have blacksmiths in my, Come in my on. blood. And uh, yeah, we, I mean, anvil, billows, the whole bit, the old school. I'm getting and when, behind you me. Said, when you said blacksmith, I, oh man, I'm loving it. So I, that's in my blood. I love it. And I just, I just think you're doing such an important thing. Don't stop it. And I bless what you're doing as well. Well, I appreciate that. Thank you so much. I love that about it because it's, it's, it's something that's very personal to me on multiple yeah, levels and stuff and everything. So that's awesome. I love that. So for everyone else that's been listening or watching, thank you so much for being a part of this episode. Be sure to leave us a, a rating, a review on the podcast platform of your choice. Comment on YouTube as well. Share the information, like, subscribe, all that other stuff. Look for us on everything that is happening. Until the next episode, know that we love you and we bless you in the name of Jesus. Thank you for listening to the Blacksmith Chronicles podcast. It is our prayer that this episode challenged you, encouraged you, and equipped you for the advancement of the kingdom of God. For more episodes or ways that you can partner with Ryan Johnson Ministries, please go to www.ryanjohnson.us or email us directly at info at ryanjohnson.us. Please join us again soon for another episode of the Blacksmith Chronicles.